And throughout today, I've been speaking on the topic of faithfulness and servanthood because I believe that Her Majesty's service to the nation is a great Christian example for us all. And as I've been speaking today, I felt a very strong anointing on this whole question about Jesus calling us to be faithful. And that is a faithfulness that is played out over a lifetime. So that at the end of our earthly lives, and we have stayed the course, and we have continued to show up, continued to persevere, continued faithfully to seek to serve God, and we hear from him, wonderful moment, wonderful moment. Pray that each and every one of us will have that privilege of hearing from Jesus, the smiling face of Jesus, well done, you good and faithful servant. Faithfulness is a key ingredient in our faith in God. I've been stressing today that God is faithful. And our faithfulness is nothing much more than an expression or reflection of his faithfulness to us. Now I want to turn you in the book, into the book of Hebrews. And we're going to start reading from verse 32 of chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 reading verse 32. Let me give you a little bit of the background as we prepare to read this passage together. The book of Hebrews was possibly written by the Apostle Paul. That's still an opinion that is held by some scholars. Most scholars actually say that we do not know who wrote the epistle. It might have been Apollos, it might have been somebody else. There's certain aspects of this epistle, including what I'm about to read, that I'd suggest it was Paul after all. I mean, R.T. Kendall believes it was Paul, and R.T. is the great doctor of the church, so, you know, who are we to disagree with? The author is not so important. We don't need to know who wrote it. It just helps us grasp a little bit of how to understand it when we hear some of these things. What is even more important, though, is not who wrote it, but who received it. And it's entitled the book of the Hebrews, suggesting that this was a Jewish community. And I believe it was a Jewish community. Some say it might have been a, a, a Gentile community that had converted to Judaism and now was coming to Christ. And this community had discovered that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, and they had turned away from their Judaism, in a sense, really, but, but to see that, that Christianity is a fulfillment of these things. The law and the temple, the priesthood, all these things were pointing towards the coming of Messiah, and now Messiah had come, they were able to embrace the fullness of God's message. <coughs> and so they had endured like that for a while. Now we know that in that society, as indeed in this society today in many parts of the world, following Jesus comes at a price. And they were persecuted. In fact, they were quite severely persecuted. None of them had been martyred. They'd not yet uh, experienced martyrdom, but they'd lost their jobs, many of them. They lost their property. Can you imagine today in London? Think about this. Can you imagine today, if you're here today, and don't let this put you off, but if you said yes to Jesus, that is, I'm committing my life to Jesus, and but before you came to the front or before we prayed for you, say, now listen, you need to know, before you go this way, you need to know that very likely before the end of this week, you're going to lose your job. And then, maybe in a month or so, you're going to lose your property. You're going to lose your house. You're going to be evicted. In fact, you're going to have to go from place to place because you will be so persecuted for following Jesus that you will, in the end, have nothing. And there may yet come a time when you will even lose your life. Ah, I wonder if there'd be that much enthusiasm. I wonder if we'd be singing, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. But that was the reality 
for these believers. And it's the reality today for many people in different parts of the world. And we don't wish this upon ourselves. But somehow, Jesus' call to discipleship makes a whole lot more sense when the gospel says, come to Jesus, die to yourself, and you will have a better life in the future kingdom of God. It makes that much more sense in the midst of persecution than what we often hear as the gospel today, come to Jesus and have your needs met. Come to Jesus and be happy. Come to Jesus and prosper. Come to Jesus and receive the good things of life. Now, in this church, we recognize that every good thing comes from God. And, and if you have a job and a good job, praise God. It's the provision of God. And God does supply so many good things. But we follow him because we love him. And we love him enough to be prepared to lose everything so that even if in this life we have to suffer and have to identify with those who suffer, it is worth it because he gives us eternal life. And this world, as we see See, it is passing away and it's going to be replaced by another world where righteousness is at home and Jesus says, well done, you good and faithful servants. Now, let me just take it a bit further. So they had experienced enough suffering that some of them were beginning to question. Some of them were beginning to ask kind of questions. Have we really made a mistake here? Because, you know, if, if God is really in this Christian message, if this is true, how come we're suffering? How come it's miserable? How come it's all going so wrong? Because they kind of still think that if God is with them, it's all going to be all right and everything's going to go well. But the real heart of the gospel message is not it's going well in every part of my life. There are people right now who are in prison, who are suffering. We see in Eritrea, the United Nations has made it very clear it is a very horrendous time of Christian persecution, arrests, killings, rape, all kinds of problems because you're serving Jesus. Ask the Christians in Iran, ask the Christians in Syria, all over the world to follow Jesus costs you everything, and that is I'm not going to say it's good. I mean, it's right. You're on the right path. Jesus says, beware when all men speak well of you. In this world, we're going to have persecutions. It's through tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. I'm encouraging you tonight. Are you feeling encouraged yet? Okay. Are you feeling encouraged yet? No, not really, I guess. But the issue is this. Our commitment to Jesus, if it means anything, it is not about the second things in life. It's not about the second things in life, the blessings that flow. When they come, we delight in them, and it's amazing and wonderful. But we say, I will have Jesus rather than silver and gold. I'll have Jesus rather than riches untold. If everything goes against me and Christ is for me, that is enough for me because I serve the true and the living God, and I'm prepared to take the rough with the smooth. Can I have a strong amen? Amen. But they're thinking, well, maybe it is time. Maybe we just got it wrong. Maybe we need to go back and just give up on this Christian life. Now, I don't know if you are right there tonight. Probably, if you are right at that point of wanting to give up, you probably wouldn't even be here. I don't know. But I do know this, that all of us at one particular time in our life need some encouragement to continue in the good way. We need some encouragement from our friends that said, don't, don't be discouraged. You put your trust in that relationship, it all dissolved, came to nothing, never mind. God is with you. You, 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 you tried to work in that job and that job has chucked you out. That man didn't understand you. And all kinds of things are working against you. And you say, well, Lord, what have you got against me? And God says, I've got nothing against you, but all things will work together for good. Just keep trusting me. And so I'm talking today about faithful endurance. All right, let's come to the passage, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. So whoever writes this is saying, I want you to recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains. Now that sounds very much like the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? I don't think we can build a whole case on that, but that does sound very much like him. 
companion, compassion on me in my chains, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Now here's his big conclusion, verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. In other words, you're not going to be disappointed. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Well, there are so many principles here. One way of ensuring that you endure is to know that you're in the hands of a good, loving, patient God. That whatever comes against you, greater is he that is in you than he that is against you. The Pilgrim's Progress, which was a story, a parable written by John Bunyan, describes the Christian life in these terms. It's like a fire, a fire burning in the hearth, and there is the devil pouring everything he can, as much cold water on the fire, everything possible to extinguish the, extinguish the flame that's burning in your heart, that's burning in your soul. Have you found that to be your experience at times? The more you want to burn for Jesus, and we're going to sing John O's song, burn, burn, light a flame within my heart, and so on, and, and people pour cold water over it. And, you know, you get opposition, you get ridicule, you get people to tell you that you are wrong, or they argue with you, or sometimes even your own fellow brothers and sisters somehow just know how to discourage you. But John Bunyan says, ah, take a look at behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, there is Jesus pouring all the fuel on the fire, fanning that fire, ensuring that fire will never go out. And as much as the devil or your friends or your enemies pour cold water on your spirituality and discourage you, and the more things that come against you, the more Jesus is working behind the scenes to sustain you. That's the first thing. You are in the hands of a God who will never let you go. Yes, give him a praise. Now, when you read the book of Hebrews in its total, you will know that many of the ways that God encourages us to stay in the right path are not all pleasant. In other words, it's the chastening of the Lord. It's the disciplining of the Lord. It's not as if God pours out heaps of judgment. It's that God will allow chastening to happen so that we, we, we learn by his loving chastening. And at times like that, when you sense that God's hand is on you and he's disciplining you, rejoice. Book of Hebrews says this shows that you are a genuine child of God. So sometimes the opposition that you face, the things that are coming against you, are the very things you should rejoice in as proof that God still loves you and that you are his child. He loves you enough not to let you get away with it. But we know that all of these judgments or chastenings they are not to be used as some kind of threat of loss of your eternal salvation. So whenever you read the book of Hebrews, and there are several warnings that are given to Christians here, and you can misinterpret them if you think it is about the threat of losing your salvation. That is not a motivation for anybody. The motivation is, however, that as you walk with Jesus, he'll continue to keep you and he wants to make you all the more fruitful. So now let's have a look at some of the human responses aided by the Holy Spirit that help us stay firm. First of all, learn to have a good memory, a spiritual memory. He says, recall the former days. Now go back, remember what it was like back then. Do you remember? He says, do you remember you were so in love with Jesus that nothing was too much for you? 
You, you, you were prepared to endure anything. And, and even when it was not you who were personally suffering, you went alongside others who were suffering and you suffered with them. You identified with them. You were willing even to embrace suffering that you might show others that you loved them and you were prepared to go to anything. And you joyfully, joyfully endured these things. It is far better for us to suffer these things because we're not living for the blessings of this life. We're not living for the supplies and the provisions of this life. We understand that our future is bright and we're moving towards something. Our faith is fundamentally in the invisible world, not the visible world. That is something that is very, very encouraging. And, and here, I was going to say Paul, whoever wrote this, was giving them a, a proof positive that they were genuinely saved, that a real work had been done in their lives because nobody without the grace of God will put up with what they put up with and rejoice in it. Recently, as I've been witnessing to many non-Christians and listening to them and talking to them and, and asking them why do they do what they do and, and look at their life, and I, I've discovered one thing which is a little disturbing, but don't worry, I will get you out of the disturbance if I disturb you for a while. But I have found that generally speaking, the non-Christians are far more consistent than the Christians. Do you find that disturbing? But do you know what I mean, for example? So they say, we live for the things of this world. They say there is no God, or if there is a God, it's not really important for us. And life is all about what we can see, feel, and touch, and enjoy now. And if in the middle of that, we can build some purpose and some values, which are maybe common sense values like do, do good to people and, and, and encourage people and don't hurt people. As long as we can do that, we can choose our own path and we can enjoy whatever we choose to enjoy and there is almost 100% consistency amongst the non-Christian world. Have you noticed that? They live consistently as if this world is all that there is. Okay, can you see that, agree to that? Now, not 100%, I'll come back to show you in a moment. Now, whereas we believers, we believe that this world ultimately does not count. Whether we're rich in this world, whether we're successful in this world, whether we're healthy, acknowledged, married, or what have you, at the end of the day, these things are not of primary importance. We live for Christ and his kingdom, and we would choose rather like Moses did to suffer with the people of God than to abandon the faith to enjoy life. Is that not what we believe? Now, how consistent are we? I think that the non-Christians are often more consistent than we are. But, but of course, they have something in their favor because the sin nature is all about self-fulfillment. And so the sin nature will make sure that they're 100% consistent. The devil makes you 100% consistent for your pathway to hell. Is that not right? But we have something more than that, we have the Holy Spirit, and the more we open up to the Holy Spirit, we can find ourselves becoming more and more consistent with the help of the Holy Spirit. So, the writer to the Hebrews says, remember what it was like when you took all that suffering and you endured for a while, he says, you endured a great struggle with suffering. You've already been through so much. You've already come so far. The fruit of God in your life has already been established. Don't blow it now. Don't mess it up now. It's like a student. I don't know. Yeah, are there any students here today? Have you finished your exams? You finish your exams, that's why you look a little, bit, little more relaxed, okay. But there comes a time in every student's life when you wonder, what are you doing? Is it worth it? And you see the mountain you have to climb in order finally to qualify and all the tests that lie ahead and you say, is there some other way? And you say, please, Heavenly Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. In other words, 
you shrink back and from, from the commitment. And somebody needs to sit you down, and often they did. It's your mum or your dad or your colleagues that say, now listen, you've already been through so much. Look at all the work you've done. Don't stop now. Don't give up now. Keep on going because you will not regret it. And that encouragement to keep on going helps a lot. Maybe in your Christian life you've said there's just one exam too many. And I don't feel prepared for what my life is bringing me right now. And God says, don't give up. You've been through so much. You've served me. You've fought many battles. And you have won many victories. Don't give up now. Remember what it was like in the beginning. And I want you to continue in that way. And so, the writer to the book of Hebrews, or the writer to the Hebrews tells them, at the end of the day, this is what I want you to know. You have begun well. Don't stop now. Continue. Endure. Whatever comes your way. Now, no obstacle is too great because God is with you. Keep on going. Keep on running. Keep on persevering. Keep on enduring. God is with you. Don't give up because you will not regret it. And then he says, verse 35, which shows us. The second, I'll leave you with this second point and leave it at that. The second way in which we can be sure that we will endure, it has to do with confidence. Now it's put here, don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't cast it away. But what it first of all means is there's a confidence. You have come to the place of assurance and maybe you struggled with this for a while. Maybe somebody has come alongside you and asked you certain questions or caused you to doubt. Say, well, you don't really believe the Bible, do you? What about this verse? What about that contradiction? And don't you know that the code of Hammer Rabbi was when in existence before Moses and all oh, comes from somewhere else? Don't you know that the apostle Paul never did this or John never said that? Don't you know? And, and they, all this stuff comes your way, especially at college, especially when you're struggling or somebody else that has been through difficult times. They say, why do you keep on doing this? You become a Job's wife to you. Why did you curse God and die? Can't you see this is all an illusion? You're surrounding yourself by people who are restricting you, who are going to hold you back. It's time you gave up on those evangelicals and those charismatics, those Pentecostals. If you want to be a believer, there's so many other ways of being a believer and doubts begin to enter your life. Sometimes the doubts are intellectual. I don't know about you, but certainly I want to examine my faith and continue to examine my faith. And I do this openly with non-Christians. With my Muslim friends, I say, now if Muhammad is the truth, then I should become a Muslim. And they say, yes, very, very quickly. I say, but by the same token, if Jesus Christ is the truth, you should become a Christian because it's all about building your life on the truth. And they say, yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. So it is all about examining your life. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. I would suggest to you, an ex unexamined faith is not worth having. Faith is not blind confidence. Faith has reasons. Now, I'm not suggesting that you pile up all the reasons, argue yourself into a position called faith. No, no, no. Faith is a supernatural gift of God. Faith is the operation of the Holy Spirit. Faith is a divine witness, a divine confidence. It is that spiritual faculty that God awakens so that as we have hands to feel and eyes to see, so we have faith to apprehend the invisible realm. It is supernatural. It transcends all argument, rational or otherwise. However, Faith has reasons. And I believe it is vital for us to examine the basis of our faith so that we may be able to answer those who ask us, what is the reason of the hope that is within you? So that we can present Christ in a society which isn't just about touchy-feely, a society that is actually claiming to base its experience on truth. And there are times when our confidence is threatened. It might be because of a difficult circumstance. 
Jesus made it very clear in the, in the parable of the sower that there are many reasons why the weed, why the, 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 the grain is choked so it doesn't bear fruit. He says there is, first of all, the deceitfulness of wealth, the cares of this world, and the desires for other things. So that's not about intellectual doubt. That's about some other kind of a doubt that we're missing out on life or life is too tough and God isn't coming through for us in the way we want him to come through for us. Or we desire other things and, and put them in place of God. Those are the things that will kill your faith. Those are the things that will stop you from being fruitful. But here he says, don't throw away your confidence. The confidence they had was a confidence in the gospel itself. The early passages of the book of Hebrews say and remind us that the gospel did not come in a vacuum. It was not preached just as a message. God confirmed his word with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that that word, especially to the Hebrews, was confirmed from the Old Testament. They could see that the Old Testament promises, the Old Testament teaching was fulfilled in Christ and there was such a wonderful sense of confidence that this was the truth. This was the one and the true and the living way that God had prepared from the beginning. It was one stream of revelation. It was not about guesswork. It was about God revealing himself and preparing us for the coming of Jesus. Remember that confidence you had. I don't know what your confidence was. Way, way back in the early days, my confidence was this. I had met with Christ and that I knew he was real. I knew he was alive. It wasn't an intellectual pursuit. Later on, I looked at some of the intellectual implications of that, and I, I did it again 10 years ago. I studied from the very beginning to see, not theoretic, not uh, you know, hypothetically, but is there a God? And not that I doubted that as such, but to look at the basis upon which I believe that God exists so I can answer those who say God does not exist. Who is Jesus? And I found of those 10 years ago when I went through that research that I'm a Christian for one reason and his name is Jesus. When you look at the life of Jesus and all that the New Testament teaches us about Jesus, there's a confidence for there is no other explanation as to this teaching about Jesus other than that Jesus actually lived. Nobody invented it. It wasn't time for that. But those early disciples believed that Jesus had, came, had come, God manifested in the flesh, died on the cross, was raised again from the dead. They'd heard him, they'd seen him, and they proclaimed him as being the Son of God risen from the dead and only one thing adequately describes or explains that proclamation happened weeks just weeks after the events the only thing that explains it is that Jesus actually came and did those things so we have confidence in the historicity of the gospel we have confidence in the veracity of the teaching of the Bible. We have confidence in our own experience. We know that we've met Jesus. He's got a hold of our lives and he's turned our lives around. Even though times we find it difficult and sometimes there is there even a God at times in those dark moments. But that confidence we had at the beginning rises up like a cork you can place on the bottom of the ocean and its buoyancy causes it to pop up to the surface every single time. That directional magnet on the inside of us, like magnetic north, you throw it off course as much as you can, but it always comes back facing where it should face. That's the nature of the faith and the life of God in us. And Paul, whoever it was, writes this, says, don't throw it away. It doesn't say don't lose it. It doesn't say don't let it wear down. He says don't throw it away. The only way you can ignore that is if you take that compass and you throw it away. Or you take that assurance and deliberately blot it out. Say, no, 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 don't do that. Don't throw it away. Revive it. Because that confidence will see you through. Now he says you have everything that it takes, but there's one thing you need. One more thing. One thing you need says, remember what it was like, you've endured, you've come so far, don't give up now. Second thing, he says, you have a confidence, you know what it's like, don't, don't throw it away, don't waste it. Third thing, he says, you just one more thing, one more thing you need. 
It's a small thing, but a big thing. He says, all you need now is endurance. All you need is the help from the Holy Spirit and the commitment on your part to say, I'm not going to turn back. Whatever it takes, whatever mess I'm in, how, whatever, whatever difficulty there is, no matter how weak I feel, how overpowered I feel, how impotent I feel, never mind. I am not going to give up. God is with me and he will see me through. And he says here, here's, here's, a pro here's a promise. It's so understated, but it's real. He said, after you have done the will of God, then you will receive the reward. You will receive the promise. What we live for is not immediate gratification or immediate fulfillment. Oh yeah, there are many blessings along the way, amen? But it's all about looking for that moment when we have been faithful against all odds, faithful, even though we've stumbled and fallen and at times it looked like we weren't going to make it. If you've not been there, you've not been very far in the Christian life. I've been there many times. But despite that, there's the, underneath there, the arms of Jesus holding us up and saying, come on, don't give up. Not long now. Just be faithful. Just keep showing up. Tomorrow, read and pray. Tomorrow, follow Jesus. Tomorrow, set your course of your life in the direction you intend it to go. And God will do the rest.